Welcome back, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the undergraduate seminar. We have a lot of people in person today. Our speaker is Justin Foos, a star TA in the department, all around excellent guy. He's going to tell us about an introduction to functional analysis into the infinite dimensional. Sounds great. Justin, take it away. Cool. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, so I'm going to preface this by saying we're, we're just going to do a surface level introduction to uh, functional analysis. Uh, I'm hoping to make this super accessible to anyone taking A22 or a uh, first year linear algebra course. Um, so let's get into it. So we start our story in, of course, linear algebra land, where we learned all about the wonderful space we know Rn which we can imagine, of course, as a set of points in n-dimensional space. You know, super easy to imagine 50-dimensional space, but uh, we can imagine it as all the points in n-dimensional space. In math, Rn has a special name. It's a type of vector space. So a vector space, as you might recall from linear algebra, is a special set with addition and scalar multiplication defined on it, such that these nice properties hold true. So this is so far just our usual A22 linear algebra definition of a vector space. Um, so in Rn, we can imagine it uh, formally as a set of real n-tuples, where each of these components or terms live in the set R of real numbers, and addition, scalar multiplication happen as we're as we're used to. So for example, two times one comma two plus negative three comma four will get us the vector negative one comma eight, assuming I know how to add things. So Rn, of course, because of how restrictive it is, we got to learn all, uh, all sorts of fun things about Rn. For example, it's super simple. We can, as I said earlier, visualize uh, vectors in Rn pretty nicely. There's a lot of nice structure to work with. And there's also, of course, the one-to-one -one correspondence between matrices and linear transformations. Sorry for the spoiler in case that wasn't covered just yet. Um, but this, along with the super related idea of the rank nullity theorem, really make essentially Rn solved. We know almost everything about Rn at this point. But what happens if we look beyond that? Other things in mathematics, like infinite tuples, spaces of functions, they're all over the place. But we can't seem to apply any of our linear algebra tools if we try and study them. Because everything we know about Rn only works because Rn is finite dimensional. So if you want to apply our linear algebra tools, we have to extend our thinking. So how are we to deal with these monstrous beasts? So one of the most important tools that help sort of ground our study in functional analysis is the idea of a norm. So a norm is our way of defining how big or how long a vector is in a space. So a norm, its formal definition is any function so we usually denote it with two double bars surrounding our vector uh, that maps our vector space x to the non-negative real numbers, such that these three intuitive properties about distances hold true. So the first one being, if we scale our vector, the size of the vector should scale appropriately. And if our vector has size zero, that must be the case that x is the zero vector, meaning the only ve uh, vector with length zero is zero itself. And this third property is the triangle inequality. So adding up two vectors and then taking their norm should get you something smaller than adding the two norms respectively. So that third point is made intuitive by, of course, the usual triangle inequality from uh, Euclidean geometry. So if we take a side length and add it to another side length of a triangle, that total sum will be bigger than the third side length that we didn't add. 
So this is where the triangle inequality uh, property comes from. When we have a vector space that has a norm, we call that a normed vector space, of course, very cleverly named, or a normed linear space. So normed vector spaces are going to help ground our study of functional analysis. They, they help give us a sense of scale. As a nice example, here in R2, we can imagine the norm of this vector here that I've drawn is simply using the Pythagorean theorem, the square root of the sum of the squares of each of its components. So here, if this is the vector x1 comma x2, you simply square x1 squared plus x2 squared, of course. So at this point, we've defined what it means for a vector to have a certain length. But with that comes also the idea of distances between two vectors. So if we have two points, this green and the blue point, we can imagine defining their distance between each other as first looking at the difference between the two. So taking, for example, this blue vector minus the green vector and taking the norm of that. How long is the, dis uh, is the vector that uh, separates the two? This defines what's called a metric. So a notion of distance between two things. Every norm induces a metric as a result. So with that comes the idea, of course, of closeness. So we can say two vectors, say, are close if the distance between them is sufficiently small. Now we have a super, uh, super important set uh, as a result of this. When we have some positive number epsilon, we can imagine a special set surrounding any given point A that we start with. So here we call it an epsilon ball as the set of points around the screen point that are within epsilon distance. So formally, it is this set here. All the x's in our vector space where the distance between x and a is less than epsilon. Now, of course, the reason why we call this an epsilon ball is because, of course, a ball, if you draw it out using the Euclidean norm, that's this is the set exactly. Everything inside this open ball is our epsilon ball. So everything here is within distance epsilon or less. So excluding the boundary would be less than epsilon. All right. With this, we now have basically everything we need to talk about a super duper fundamental idea in functional analysis and analysis in general. And it's the idea of convergence. So if we have a bunch of points here in blue that we enumerate from one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on, all the way to infinity, notice that these seem to get closer and closer and approach the screen point here. So we'll want to talk about a formal way to define what it means for a sequence to converge to a point. The way we do this is by noticing that if we use, if you look at any epsilon ball surrounding this green point, there's some number beyond which every blue point will be within this epsilon ball. So for example, these points in red, everything beyond this blue point, which is in red, will be within this epsilon ball. So within epsilon distance of our green. Notice that we can do this no matter how small our epsilon ball becomes. If this is true, for every epsilon ball we pick, there's always some tail end of the sequence that gets close enough to our green point. Then we say this blue sequence converges to the green one. So the formal definition is if we have a sequence in our normal linear space, it converges to this green little x. If given any epsilon greater than zero, you can find some big N where everything beyond the big N blue point is within epsilon of the green one. Okay. So this is the idea of convergence in a normed linear space. Let's look at a quick example, because things are getting a bit too analysis related at too early on in the morning. All right, so 
let's consider this set here. This is a sequence of points in R2. So this first x component will be cosine of n over n, second one sine of n over n. If you plot out various points with uh, n values plugged in, we get this nice spiral all the way to what seems to be zero. We're going to claim that this sequence converges to the point zero comma zero. Let's do a proof. So we fix an epsilon greater than zero. We want this to be arbitrary to show no matter how big our ball is, there's always some blue points that eventually are all inside of it. We claim that this big N, taking it to be one over epsilon, will do the trick. So to see that, if you look at any Xn point in our sequence, so any of these blue points, and you find its distance from zero, so the x over here, that looks exactly like this. So we're taking any point and finding what the difference it is with zero, zero is, and then finding that norm. Using some algebra and definition of Euclidean norm, we can obtain some nice simplification and we're left with one over n. So for the nth term in our sequence, the distance from green will always be one over n. So of course that depends on what n, uh, nth blue point we're at. Recall that if we have n being greater than this big N, right, as per the definition, whenever little n is bigger than big N, this one over n distance will be smaller than the one over big N. Because of course, one over a bigger number is smaller than one over a smaller, uh, a smaller number. So since n was one over epsilon, we can plug that in. Simplification happens, and we're left with beauty. The distance between any nth term that is beyond the big nth one and the zero point here in green will be less than this epsilon that we fixed at the beginning. So we converge to zero. So this is an example of some nice uh, sequence in our normed linear space that converges to a point. Now, let's get into the spicy stuff. We know that R2 is just a set of all real two tuples, R3, set of all three tuples, and so on. Now, it doesn't make sense for us to go all the way to infinity and talk about all the infinite tuples uh, of real numbers. And it turns out it does make sense. For, for people who are currently doing A22 homework, his infinity is our little mm -hmm. omega. That's okay. It's still the same yes. space. <laughs> Helpful for the assignment. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, anytime. <laughs> uh, so usually this is denoted with R infinity or R omega or R with a fancy N for the natural numbers. And we can imagine associating it with the set of all real sequences. So each of these is a real number, and there's infinitely many of them, and they're ordered. So some examples of sequences in this space is 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to infinity, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, alternating. And of course, addition happens as we'd expect. So does scalar multiplication. Everything happens term-wise. So adding up these two sequences, you just take corresponding terms and add them up. So pretty analogous to regular Rn at this point. Now, one easy way to visualize this is to imagine plotting the set of points in R2. So here we have a sort of Cartesian plane. We can associate this real sequence with perhaps a function whose inputs are each of the natural numbers. So whatever this function that we're about to define, this function at one is gonna be the first term of our sequence. The function at say four will be the fourth term of our sequence. So in general, the nth term of this function, or sorry, the nth input of this function will be the nth term. And the plot of this will be 
pretty nice and simple. Now, what if we wanted to define a norm on this R infinity space? What does it mean for a sequence to be super big or super tiny? Or even how do we know when two sequences are close to each other? Now, there's all sorts of ways we could sort of approach this. One way is to try and appeal to our Euclidean norm. Consider these orange heights of our function. And what happens if we add up the squares of each of them? Sort of like how we did squared of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Does it make sense to define a norm this way? And unfortunately, not always. What if our function didn't decrease fast enough? So these orange heights didn't decrease to 0 quick enough, and our sum is not finite. How do we know we can add up infinitely many things and still get a finite number? So that's one problem with this norm. Another alternative is to maybe try defining the norm to be the absolute furthest distance any of these purple points get from the n-axis or the horizontal axis. So here, we can maybe define the norm of this 1 over n sequence to be just 1, because that's the furthest distance any of these purple points get to the horizontal axis. And again, there's a bit of a problem, namely with any sequence that is unbounded. How do we measure how big this function, this sequence is? There is no upper bound for how far any of these purple points get, so we're also at an impasse here. The issue is R infinity is just a bit too big for us to be able to define a nice norm on it. So what we could do is define what are called LP spaces. These are going to be spaces where we're able to take such norms. So the formal definition of an LP space is if we have any number P that is at least 1, then LP is a set of all real sequences such that this number right here, the series, we were trying to add up all the terms raised to the pth power, of course, an absolute value to keep things non-negative. We want to see, does this converge? If it does, our sequence is in LP. And with this being a finite number, we can define the LP norm to be simply this sum, but take the pth root of it. So this is our infinite analog of our Euclidean norm. Take the pth power of each term, add it up, and then take the pth root of that. We call this the LP norm. So super nice. Here's an example. We have 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, all the way to infinity. And its graph looks something like this. If you want to check if this element is in L2, we can consider the sum of the squares of each of these orange heights. So if we have a look at that, this will be the sum of 1 plus 1 half squared plus 1 third squared all the way to the infinity. If we add this up, it turns out this is actually equal to pi squared over 6. Go figure. So that means, since this is a finite number, it is in L sub or L2, because here we've raised everything to the second power. This means we can define a norm, uh, the norm of this thing, and find it to be exactly the square root of pi squared over 6 which is pi over root 6. So quite an odd number to find in a sequence of just nice 1 over natural numbers. Take math B42 for the proof. Oh, <laughs> math B42, it's great. Yes, math B42 will, will pop up quite a bit in this, in this seminar, actually. Oh. So what if we considered the sequence uh, and trying to check if it's an L1, where we don't raise any of the absolute values to a power other than 1. So this will give us the sequence um, 1, 1 half, 
but we're going to take the sum of it to get the harmonic series. This is a bit of an ugly series, although it's a nice counterexample often, that actually diverges to infinity. These numbers don't get small enough. So since this series is not finite, this sequence we chose here does not lie in L1. Oh. It lies in L2, but not L1. Let's consider now this sequence, the constant sequence of just ones. If we try and, of course, find the two norm, uh, L2 norm of this thing, we'll, we'll get a bit of an issue because we're adding infinitely many ones. And that, of course, goes to infinity. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is not in L2. We could apply the same exact logic for any P that we choose. This will always be just a sum of ones. And so we're left with an infinite sum all the time. So this sequence is not in any of the LP spaces where P is some number that we choose greater than or equal to 1. But we can extend this definition of LP to talk about that other norm that we defined earlier, the one where we looked at the furthest distance between any of these purple points and the horizontal axis. So if P is infinity, we can define L infinity as a set of all real bounded sequences with what's called the supernorm. So taking the supremum of all of these heights Oh. And that'll be our L infinity norm, our sup norm. In this example, each of the xi's have absolute value equal to one. So that means the supremum of all the xi's is just going to be the number one. And so that's exactly what the infinity norm or the sup norm of this sequence one, 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 one would be. So this would be an element of L infinity, but not any of the LPs where P is a finite number. Based on that, we can make a couple of remarks about our LP spaces. One thing is that every element of LP is a sequence that converges to zero, meaning if x1 all the way to x infinity is an LP, then these xi's have to go to zero because we're summing up infinitely many uh, power p terms in this summation. Oh. On a related note, we have for any p less than q, so if you have a q which is a bigger number than p, lq actually contains lp, meaning if you're an lp, you're also an lq. So this is sort of an increasing uh, sequence of sets. We could sort of intuitively imagine why this is, as if x1, x2, all the way to infinity is in LP, that means these purple numbers shrink fast enough oh. to zero. And eventually, they're all within zero, based on our first, first uh, remark. If we try and raise these numbers to a bigger power, the numbers that are close enough to zero will get even closer. You can think, for example, 0 0.5 squared will get you 0.25. So raising these numbers, which are close enough to zero, to a number bigger than one will get you an even smaller sequence eventually. So all of these will be super duper small because we're raising it to an even bigger power. So this should also be within LQ. Intuitively, it's a lot easier for this red series to converge because all of these got super duper small compared to the purple ones. All right, so how are we doing for, for questions? Why should Xn, the limit of Xn should converge to zero? Sure. So the reason why that would be is because we're going to be taking a sum 
of infinitely many values here, right? Recall that in order for an element to be an LP, this sum has to converge to a finite number. So the sum of all these xi's in absolute value have to be finite. So this can't be the case if we're never going to go to zero. Right? Otherwise, we'd be stuck adding up a bunch of things which don't get small enough. There's no way that'll end up converting to a finite number. All right. Uh, someone raised their hand on Zoom. Um, yeah, go ahead. Ask, uh, ask your question. Yeah, that was me. Um, so I, I think um, maybe a natural question to ask here. Uh, I don't know if you want to address it now. Is um, we didn't need norm and convergence in final dimensional vector spaces. Why can't we just continue this path and do linear algebra with infinity dimensional vector spaces? Why do we need the norm? Why do we need to bring analysis in? That's that's actually a great question. Um, so the reason why usually we want to introduce a uh, norm uh, or some sense of convergence is often uh, things aren't very uh, easy to work with just on their own. If we can approximate things close enough and learn more about how elements that are close enough to other elements uh, inherit sort of properties based on that sequence um, that converges to it. Um, so it's it's a tough question, but um, one reason is we can sort of have this idea of maybe not everything is reachable, but we can approximate things close enough, and that'll help us ob obtain information uh, about this seemingly out of reach or potentially out of reach element in our space. And that cannot happen in fine dimensional vector spaces? Um, usually not, because um, in finite dimensional vector spaces, we'll, we'll come to learn that spans of things are often restricted to finite. Um, and so there's never an issue of, can we ever add infinitely many things um, that may be perhaps very different in direction? but still uh, approach something. Okay, because infinitely dimensional uh, vector spaces, they also have a basis, right? Yes, that's right, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was a good okay. question. <laughs> All right, so uh, with that said, we can now have a look at some more complicated examples, or rather, some more complicated spaces such as the set of functions over R. Previously, we just talked about sequences of real numbers. Now let's talk about these sort of sequences on a continuum, for lack of a better word. So if we wanted to define a norm on the set of real valued functions, we'll have to first look, consider an interval and start adding things inside of this interval. So instead of doing this countably infinite sum here, since we're adding up things on a sort of continuum, we're going to have to resort to integration. Yeah. So big LP space is what we're now getting into. So big LP, where we have some interval defined AB, is the space of all real functions that map this interval into the reals such that this integral of the pth powers of the absolute value converges to a finite number. So as we did with little lp, this can now allow us to give a norm by taking the pth root of whatever this definite integral is. So we call this the big LP norm of big LP. As we did with little lp, we can extend this definition to p equals infinity. So the set big L infinity 
is all the bounded real functions on AB. And the norm of that will be the supremum of F. So sort of the highest possible distance or um, height of our function that could, it can never be on the interval A to B. So it's quite analogous to little LP uh, in both of these definitions we have here. It turns out the set of continuous functions, say on the intervals zero to one, is a subspace of an LP space because we're bounding it on this nice little interval. If it's continuous, the integral will definitely exist and so be finite. Okay, so now we've defined little LP and big LP spaces. We're going to get into the definition of a perhaps more complicated vector space structure. To do this, we'll have to define a special kind of sequence. So if we have a sequence here in blue, that perhaps they may converge to some number, notice that eventually there's a, a point in which the sequence, so everything beyond a certain number of these blue points, are all within a certain epsilon radius of each other. So. Uh, oops, this should not be colored red. <laughs> um, eventually, these blue points get to a certain point where everything is within epsilon of everything else. This is the idea of a Cauchy sequence. So a Cauchy sequence in a normal linear space um, is one where if you're given any epsilon distance, you can find some big N sort of checkpoint where everything beyond the big nth term in this blue sequence will be next to any other uh, term after the big nth one and within epsilon of it. So every point beyond the big nth one is within epsilon of every other one. So the points in our sequence get arbitrarily close to each other eventually. This is what we call a Cauchy sequence. So notice that no matter where we place this uh, epsilon ball about these red points, they'll always contain each other. So that's the idea of a Cauchy sequence. Now, intuitively Cauchy sequence should always converge to a number since they get always arbitrarily close. If this is the case, which it might not always be, we say X is a Banach space. So X is a Banach space if it is a normal linear space and every Cauchy sequence in this space converges in the space. All right, so we'll get into some examples to see cases where a Cauchy sequence might not converge in our space. So some nice examples of Cauchy, uh, or sorry, Banach spaces are, of course, Rn. Uh, LP spaces are also Banach spaces. If you have any Cauchy sequence in any of these uh, normed linear spaces, it'll absolutely converge to a number inside of that space. So in a sense, convergence makes sense uh, very loosely in all these spaces. If a sequence gets arbitrarily close to itself and it'll sort of converge to a number in your space. All right, let's consider a maybe not so intuitive example. The set C00 is defined to be all the real sequence with finitely many non-zero terms. So this uh, sequence that we have defined here of sequences contains elements of C00, because there's only finitely many non-zero terms in each of them. So we've got sort of a sequence of sequences scenario here and get quite mind blown. If we imagine this, the first uh, sequence in our sequence is this sequence here. 
the one where the first term is one and everything else is zero. The second element has one half in the second, third, a one third in the third, and so on. It looks like these sequences converge to a new sequence, namely the one, one half, one third, one fourth, all the way to infinity sequence. So here in the supnorm, recall that the supnorm was the furthest distance from zero. This means if we want to find how far two things are in the supnorm, we basically measure the furthest distance apart they are term wise. So here, if I compare any two terms in this sequence, notice that they agree up to some nth term. So for example, this would be one, one half, one third, one fourth, and then zero on everything else. Well, this could be say one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and all the way everything else perhaps being zero. So they agree up to some nth term where they might disagree. Um, yeah, so their difference, it turns out, so let me get a pen here. Say we had one, one half, and then zero everywhere else. And we find its distance from one, one half, one third, one fourth, and then zero everywhere else. If we subtract these two uh, numbers, we get zero, zero, and then one third, if we do this bottom one minus the top one, one fourth, and then zero, zero, and so on. Oh. Right? So this number here, if we take its soup norm, we get exactly one third, because that's the biggest, the furthest distance this sequence is from all zeros. And we could do this for any n we choose. We didn't have to stop this at the one half uh, term here. If you do this for any xn and xm in this sequence of sequences, you'll notice that the points at which they differ get smaller and smaller. Right. So here, since we stopped it at the one third term, the distance from it and any point beyond is at most one third. Same thing if we stopped it at, let's say, the one fifth term. And then every term beyond that differs by no more than one fifth or one sixth. So this is actually a Cauchy sequence because the distances between points in our sequence or elements in our sequence gets arbitrarily small. So this sequence is Cauchy, but you might notice that this element that they converge to or appear to converge to does not have finitely many zeros in it. So even though each of these terms are in C00, their limit is not in C00 because it does not have finitely many non-zero terms. So, C00 is an example of a normed linear space under the soup norm, but it is not a Banach space because we found a Cauchy sequence that doesn't converge in C00. All right. So Banach spaces are quite special because they tell us a lot of info about convergence. OK. So now let's do a bit of linear algebra recap. So for everyone at A22, get ready. This is important for your midterm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so of course, a span uh, is a set of all linear combinations of a set of elements, a set of vectors specifically. An important note here is we emphasize the word finite in this span 
So a span of a set is a set of all finite linear combinations. Similarly, a set S is linearly independent if whenever we have a linear dependence relation, so whenever you're able to combine elements of S to get to the zero vector, it must be the case that each of the coefficients were zero. There's no other way. So this is basically identical with our uh, notions of spans and linear independence from linear algebra. We say a subset B is, for a vector space is a basis for it if it's linearly independent and it spans X. So this also agrees with our uh, linear algebra definition of basis. In infinite dimensions, we have to add in this special name here, a Hamel basis. A Hamel basis is basically a basis, but using these definitions of spans and linear independence. All right, let's consider an example. So here we have a set uh, of vectors, which is uh, sequences which have one in exactly one term and zero everywhere else. Uh, how can we generate an element 1, 1, 1? It's very tempting to say that this is a basis for our sequence space that we have here say, uh, LP or L infinity. It's easy to note that this is probably linearly independent as each one is only one in exactly one term, but we actually cannot generate the element one, 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 and so on to infinity. Because that requires infinitely many of these vectors to be added together. So this set here does not span the entirety of, say, L infinity. This means this is not a basis, not a Hamel basis, for L infinity. Uh, oops, is something might have happened with... Parker's end. Uh, is he still on the Zoom call? Uh, I don't see him. Uh oh. <laughs> um, we can wait around, I, I suppose. Yeah. Can I ask you a question in the meantime? Sure. Yeah. So I guess uh, I'm actually a physics major. I've sat in on a functional analysis course and I had no idea what was going on. Okay. Um, and so I think that you're, you're giving me a pretty good grasp here. So I guess kind of the, the motivation is like, yeah, we want, you know, we want, uh, and you know, an analogy to linear algebra in, in infinite dimensions. So you start there. And so now you have, you basically end up in, uh, in, uh, you know, infinite sequences, uh, you know, which are, fun, you know, functions from naturals to reals, I guess, in this case. Mm -hmm. Oh, from here hey so here at the large room we had a building wide power glitch so that's why we disappeared we'll be up soon oh huh. okay uh all right well i guess i'll be back soon <laughs> but uh yeah so any so you start with uh you know you end up at at sequences because that's like i guess r omega like you said mm -hmm. and then uh i believe shy at you know asked the question of like why you know why is analysis relevant right and i guess mm -hmm. that the whole answer to that is you know well uh your euclidean norms you know your your different norms don't aren't always perfectly analogous and so we want the analogy analogy to work so we separate you know things into these lp spaces so that the analogies work mm -hmm. the analysis is the glue that holds the analogy together yeah yes okay all right cool that's Thank right uh, yeah, no problem. So to interrupt, folks, uh, we just lost power briefly. <laughs> so our, our their seminar room is back. Uh, so anyway, we're back. Awesome. Uh, I 
don't think too much was missed. Um, but as a quick recap, uh, a Hamel basis for a vector, a normal linear space, or even just a vector space, is one that's linearly independent and that spans x. So we consider this example here, which perhaps is a subset of L infinity. And we asked if this was a basis or not. It turns out this isn't a basis because we're unable to generate this specific element of L infinity. This requires us to add infinitely many of these sequences together. But recall that our spans restricted us, the definition of span restricted us to only uh, finite linear combinations of our basis vectors. So 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is not in the span of this set. So this set here is not a Hamel basis for L infinity. It's a Hamel basis for C0, 0, the set of all sequences with finitely many non-zero terms, because we only need finitely many of these sequences to add together to hit all those finitely many non-zero entries that we want. So a Hamel basis is slightly pathetic, but not in a super mean way. Uh, a Schauder basis is a little stronger. We say a subset B is a Schauder basis for X if every element in X can be uniquely expressed as the infinite linear combination of the elements of B. So with the, uh, this can be considered a Schauder basis, perhaps, of L infinity, but not a Hamel basis. In fact, a Hamel basis for L infinity would require uncountably many elements. So notice that, of course, in infinite dimensional spaces, there's an important distinction between two different kinds of bases. So in finite dimensional space, a basis is just a basis, no questions asked. In infinite dimensional spaces, you have to be a little more precise with what kind of basis you mean. There's, all, there's multiple different kinds of bases. Uh, and as we saw, Hamel and Schauder are two different kinds of bases. Now, in linear algebra, uh, we learned all about the importance of linear transformations. They are a super duper fundamental part of A22 and just linear algebra in general. And so we'll, we'll just recall this definition of a linear map. A map T between linear spaces is linear if it preserves addition and scalar multiplication. So the usual linear stuff. We can add a special name to certain kinds of linear maps. That is a bounded linear operator. So in a normed linear space between x and y, we call any linear transformation t a bounded linear operator. If we can find some real number c, such that the norm of the output of tx for any x is smaller than if we just scaled the norm of x by c. So intuitively, t is bounded if it does at most scale vectors by c, intuitively, for a bounded linear operator. Some examples include our usual uh, scale things by two. This is definitely bounded because, well, it at most scales things by two. This function here called the evaluation function, which takes an element of LP and simply spits out uh, the first term, let's say, of our sequence. That would be a bounded linear operator. An interesting example is what's called the Volterra operator. So getting quite fancy with the names is it's a function. It's a linear function from L2 over the interval 0 to 1 to L2, 0 to 1, such that f of x, 
So a function maps to its definite integral from zero to x. So in a sense, anti-differentiation. This is actually a bounded linear operator. So it turned a super duper fundamental theorem in fun functional analysis is for linear operators, being bounded is the same as being continuous. Now, since we're getting close to time, uh, I'll quickly blaze through a sketch of the proof. Um, since t is bounded, it at most scales things by c. That includes distances uh, between two points. t of x minus x zero will map to t of x minus t of x zero. So if two points are within delta of each other, then their images will be within, by linearity, uh, c times delta. Because this vector, its norm, gets scaled by at most c. And so, of course, if you want to apply our definition of continuity, we could just take delta to be epsilon over c. So every point with an epsilon over c of x0 will cause the images to be within, at most, c times epsilon over c of each other. And so that would be less than or equal to epsilon distance. So other direction will be uh, skipped for the sake of uh, time. With this, we could define the operator norm uh, of a linear operator, of a bounded linear operator, by seeing what does it scale things at most by. So this is the operator norm of a linear bounded linear operator. The set of all bounded linear operators is actually a Banach space with this norm. So as I mentioned, so it's intuitively the largest scaling factor uh, that T applies to vectors. So with some clever use of what's called the cauchy schwarz inequality, you can show that the Volterra operator uh, is actually has norm 2 over pi. Uh, as a sneak peek to some more advanced concepts, a Banach algebra is a Banach space with some notion of multiplying things together, such that the norm of the product is less than or equal to the product of the norms. And some interesting idea from Banach algebra is if you have an operator, some vector with norm less than one, then the inverse of the identity, the multiplicative identity map, minus that element t is actually this geometric series here. So if we consider our Volterra operator, this seems to suggest that it's possible to undo integration, i.e. to differentiate something, with some repeated integration, which is quite mind-blowing. But this is only sometimes possible, of course, when our operator has norm less than one. OK, now final bit of this seminar is we'll talk about Hilbert spaces. Um, a Hilbert space is simply a vector space with uh, an inner product that forms a Banach space under this norm. It's so basically a dot product, but more generalized. So two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is 0. In L2, we can define an inner product by integrating the product of the, vector, of the functions. Using this definition, we can, sit, we can know that since odd functions times even functions is always odd, and integrating on a symmetric region gives you 0, every odd function and even function are orthogonal to each other. In L2, uh, negative 1 to 0, instead of, or negative 1 to 1 instead of 0, 1. So inner product gives us a sense of perpendicular vectors. Uh, so Justin, I'm just going to yes. pause you for a sec. So it's sure. now 201. If people have classes they have to run off to, if you've got other things, totally OK to run off. You're totally welcome to. Uh, cool. I get the sense Justin has a little bit more material that he wants to share with us. But if you've got to run, you got to run. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll just give people a moment to do that.
I'll see you 822 people at three. Yeah. Some of you at least. Uh, Great. Uh, before you run, please make sure you sign the thingy. Have you signed? That's it. Great. Oh my gosh, huge turnout. Mm -hmm. oh, there's, oh, there's more on the back page? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> Great. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. I'll see you folks at three. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for coming out. Uh, sorry to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Justin, take it away. You've got a still a pretty good audience here. This is still bigger than usual seminars. Cool. I'll try not to keep uh, too long. Okay, sure. It's All right. So um, we have the sense of perpendicular vectors in our Hilbert space. Um, we have a notion of a new kind of basis. Yeah, there's even more bases to introduce. Uh, an orthonormal basis. So an orthonormal basis is a subset of your Hilbert space such that everything in that set is of norm one, so of unit length, and any two distinct vectors in your uh, set E are perpendicular to each other. So that these two properties on their own, we say E is orthonormal. As soon as we add in this third condition where E is maximal, so we can't add in any more vectors to keep it orthonormal. That means we call E an orthonormal basis. An example is uh, this one we saw earlier, which we know is a Schauder basis for L infinity. This is an orthonormal basis for the space L2, where we can define uh, the inner product of two sequences to be uh, what makes sense, like the dot product, multiply corresponding terms and add the result. All right, those in MAT D42 might recognize this basis uh, as an orthonormal basis for big L2 from 0 to 2 pi. So all of these vectors right here are orthogonal to each other. If you try and integrate their product from 0 to 2 pi, you'll always get 0. And they all have norm 1 in the space L2 uh, from 0 to 2 pi. So this is an orthonormal basis for L2 uh, from 0 to pi. A cool uh, property about orthonormal bases is you can always reach any vector in H by adding up projections onto these ortho, uh, sub elements of your orthonormal basis. So we can sort of imagine measuring how similar the directions of x and en are, and then scaling that up by the corresponding en. This series is called the Fourier series of x. So if we look back to our orthonormal basis for L2 from 0 to 2 pi. Using this fact about orthonormal bases, we can actually get use, uh, obtain the fact that every function, this includes every continuous function, um, who's, that is square integrable on 0 to 2 pi, so basically an element of L2 uh, from 0 to 2 pi, can be written as an infinite sum of sines and cosines. So this is uh, one concept mentioned in that Matt B42, which is I find quite cool. Um, and this series we can basically truncate at a large enough term, a uh, large enough number to get a pretty good approximation of our point x. So an example is if we Approximate if you write out the series for a function, let's say here f of x equals x, as a sine sum of sines and cosines, and you stop at say the eighth term, you'll get a pretty good approximation on your desired interval. So here this is the, the first eight terms of the Fourier series for f of x equals x. So using this fact, if you have a Hilbert space and an orthonormal uh, basis 
for your Hilbert space, you can approximate nearly everything with nearly anything. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you have a Hilbert space, so some notion of inner product uh, and completeness, of course, uh, meaning you're a Banach space, uh, and you have an orthonormal basis, or at least some orthonormal set, then you can get some pretty good approximations of basically anything you want in the set. So, of course, I find this idea incredibly cool. So, uh, let's talk about very briefly some other ways you can approximate things. So, the Legendre polynomials are an orthogonal set in L2 negative 1 to 1. They are a bunch of polynomials that help approximate other functions that are defined on this interval. Um, they do much better than Taylor polynomials at approximating globally. So Taylor polynomials require the function to be differentiable at a point and taking infinitely many derivatives from there. The genre doesn't need that differentiability condition. It doesn't even have to be continuous. As long as you can take the integral, you can approximate it using these polynomials. So, so here to end off, here are some super cool, I find, uh, approximations you can do. So here in Desmos, I've approximated the square root function in red using a bunch of tangent functions. So I've taken some tangent functions, made sure they're an orthonormal basis, or at least an orthonormal set, and I've approximated square root of x plus 2 on negative 1 to 1. So that's quite cool, I find. And I've also approximated e to the negative x, an exponential, with rational functions, a sum of rational functions in blue. This is in the space big L2 from 1 to infinity. So notice it actually gets quite good beyond uh, the number 1. Good luck getting Taylor to do that. So with that, we've basically only scratched the surface of functional analysis. There's all sorts of cool ideas that you can get into. I myself, I'm still learning all about it um, in the awesome reading course with uh, Ray, with Grinnell. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the seminar. Uh, it's I've had a lot of fun sort of making this seminar, and I'm glad to be part of it. Uh, so we've got a tradition in our seminar for the people online. Uh, please fill out this seminar feedback form. Uh, Justin's a student. He's still learning this stuff. He's taking a reading course on it. Feedback is much, much, much appreciated. Um, thank you, folks, who stuck around for the end of the talk. That was pretty sweet. Um, do we have any questions, things people want to ask Justin while we still have them on the line?